what he represents is patriarchy. We're here to do work as men, as patriarchs. There's nothing more natural than being a father. Welcome back from lunch. I hope you guys had some good conversations. Uh, this next guy is going to give you a lot to talk about. He and I uh, hung out at the poolside last night and talked church history and sociology and about everything. Jeff Younger is a father of two sons, a mathematician and a brilliant mind. I want you to welcome him to the stage. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I am not going to have good news today. I'm going to tell you some things that are tough to hear. I'm going to tell you some things that you're going to need to do that you're not going to want to do. We need to develop in this country a notion of cancel-proof fatherhood. We talk a lot about cancel culture and its danger to us, our movement, as men, as just people who have businesses and so forth. We don't talk about preventing the canceling of fatherhood. And we're reaching a point where the institutions of the state and the institutions of our matriarchal enemies have reached a point where they're almost able to do this. So the patriarchy is truly in peril. I want to start, as always, by giving some gratitude. I want to ask your forgiveness if, if I have offended any of you and offer a prayer. I want to thank Anthony Johnson. He's really modeled honor, courage, and commitment. I think he's a man who uh, has given us all opportunities, and he's, he's kept his word to me every single time. I've never had to have a written contract or anything with this man. He does what he says. You can't say that a lot these days, so it's really worth mentioning. I want to pray. Please stand. I, I believe standing in the presence of the Lord. Oh, heavenly King, comforter, spirit of truth, who are everywhere present and filling all things, treasury of good gifts and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us of all impurities and save our souls, O oh good one. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. These are my two boys, James and Jude. That's James on your left. That's Jude on the right. I named him after the brothers of Jesus. James is middle name. He's Christian name. He's named uh, Damon, which is my name, after uh, Cosmos and Damien. They're the unmercenary physicians from Syria who converted, through miracles, converted the country of Armenia, the first Christian country in the world. Jude is named after the prophet Daniel. Now I want to tell you the shocking truth. It is illegal for me to speak to you today. I'm breaking the law, and I'm breaking the law uh, given to me by a judge, a gag order, I want to show it to you. This is the gag order. It says that I'm not allowed to make any videos, do any type of interviews, news interviews, documentaries, television appearances, radio appearances, internet radio appearances, blog posts, social media posts, social media posts, picturing the children, doing live social media feeds of the children, doing any type of post, blog, broadcast, or recording, whether written or electronic, discussing cisgender, transgender, gender fluidity, gender dysphoria, gender identity, and whether the children are masculine, feminine. It is illegal for me to tell you that my boys are male. I'm talking to my judge right now, Judge Mary Brown, Dallas County. I'm not going to follow your gag order. I'm never going to follow your unconstitutional legal gag order. If you believe that gag order is constitutional and moral, you're obligated to give me the maximum criminal sentence under criminal contempt that you can give me, and I will issue a writ of habeas corpus, and we'll go to the Supreme Court of Texas, and we'll see who's right. That's the fifth time I've told you. Yeah. I am not following unconstitutional laws, mandates, or orders ever again, and don't you do it either. You're conditioning the matriarchy to push you around. Don't do it. I'm going to say whatever I want whenever I want, however I want, and I have a right to do it, and I have a duty to do it for my sons, and I'm going to continue to do it. I'm not one of these guys that's going to opine much about what the supreme virtues are, but I thought this was pretty good. You stand to lose everything, but you still do the right thing. So taking $1.2 million, took my retirement, 
That's what it's taken for me to defend my boy. Now they're trying to take my boy's genitals and eventually kill him. And if they think for one second that I'm not going to keep swinging and punching and kicking, they got another thing coming. I ain't stopping for nothing. And if I live like Diogenes in a pot with nothing but a woman nagging me all damn day, I'm happy to do it. I'm not stopping. If I'm going down, I'm going down swinging. Let's talk about how this happened. Let's go back a little bit. And this is, I think this is really instructive in how our society is abusing the trust that men place in their families and the false views that many men have about the laws surrounding families. These are my boys. This is my son, James. You know, we go to church, and he noticed I wear a suit when we go to church, and this is me fitting him for his first church suit. That's them. They just programmed their first electric circuit, a voice-activated circuit that could turn a light on and off. You can see that Jude's very happy. Jude is uh, very, very uh, uh, good at logic and thinking things through. He was very proud of that. That's James when he goes rabbit hunting. He heard all these stories in my family about me when I was a kid. I went out with an Apache throwing stick up by Lubbock, and I used to hunt jackrabbits all the time, bring a couple home for the pot. So he wanted to do that, so I got him a hunting boomerang from Australia, and uh, that's him back, back from the creek uh, after he got a couple of rabbits. So this is what happened to him. This is him at four years old. That's the website of his mom. She's a pediatrician in Capel, Texas. I name names. Her name is Ann Georgilis. She is a pediatrician in Capel, Texas. She had my son on her website to help advertise her business. All the while she was complaining that I was posting pictures of him on the internet. So I pointed this out in court, that not only does she, is she posting on the internet, but she's posting him as a boy when, it's, when it raises money for her, when, it, when it's commercial. She didn't even believe that he was a girl. The next day, that's how she put him on the website, in a pink dress with a bow in his hair. And it just really happened that fast. Do you know the court did absolutely nothing about this? So at the time, we had a court order which prohibited either one of us from, from presenting the boy uh, in a way that he wasn't known to third parties. So if somebody knew him as a girl, I had to present him as a girl. So here she is. She's presenting him as a boy, and then she presents him as a girl, no consequences. That's him at one of his uh, appointments at a pediatrician named Dr. Jennifer Pape in Flower Mound, Texas. That is the pediatrician that diagnosed this boy with gender dysphoria. So to, how can you be gender dysphoric if you only present as a girl with your mom, but with everybody else you present as a boy? How can that be gender dysphoric? Gender dysphoria requires consistency in the presentation. So that was just nutty, but that's him in a dress, a sundress, no doubt. That's me picking him up. So she used to do this stuff to provoke me. She wanted me to be violent. So this is me picking my boy up. Comes out like this. She makes it seem like for him, it's like some big game. But I think Jude's face pretty much says it all. And it tells you what Jude thinks about all this. We'll get to that a little later. She now dresses him, here he is a little older, she now dresses him up like a drag queen everywhere he goes. He goes to school like this. She's given him a fake name, Luna. The schools, despite the fact that I've told the schools they don't have my consent to do this, have changed his name. And they've done this all against my will and I've been fighting the schools ever since. I'm headed toward a federal lawsuit with them, which is gonna cost me a lot more money. But that's how, how he is known in his school, all without my consent. So I'm going to ask you, if you can't stop this as a father in Texas, do, they, do your children really belong to you under the law? Are they really yours under the law? We're going to get to that question too. The court actually ordered that my son be socially transitioned to a girl. It's the first time in Texas that's ever happened. I was enjoined from cutting my son's hair because 
Dr. Ann Georgilis said she wanted to grow it out long like a girl's. So the court enjoined me from doing that, but they never stopped her from transitioning my son. Think about that for a minute. I'm gonna ask you again. Under the law, are your children yours? This is Judge Mary Brown. This is my judge, the one that issues illegal orders and allows my son to be transitioned against my will and without a verdict from a jury. She's, uh, you can go out and see on YouTube hearings. People have recorded hearings. I've seen them on YouTube. I don't know the people that have recorded them, but they've recorded hearings and you can see her in action. And it's not much better than that picture. What times do we live in when this is happening to kids? When fathers can't stop it. Fathers not only can't, can't teach their kids now, they can't stop people from physically and mentally and emotionally abusing their children. What is it about this time that lets that happen? It's shameful. And that's why I say shame on this age. Shame on this age. Shame on its principles. The people know what is going on. Fathers know this is happening in courts. Judges know. Judges in Texas that don't want this to happen. Judges on the Supreme Court. Uh, officials that sit on the Judicial Conduct Commission know this is going on. And yet still, these effeminate bastards march through the corridors of power telling us that we have to martyr our children, castrate them, and condemn them to a life of despair and suicide. Long ago, we should have told them, no, not only no, but you will end your tyranny over our children. We should have done this a long, long time ago, and we didn't. And it's almost too late. I get asked all the time, I was just asked at lunch, do people really believe this crazy stuff? Do they really believe that a boy's a girl? And a, and a girl's a boy? I mean, do they really believe this? You know, um, I, I often use this analogy. You know, it, think about the most totalitarian government you can imagine. And suppose they tried to torture a man, a father, into saying that his son was a girl. Well, they, they probably could torture him into saying it. Do you think they could torture him into actually believing it? They've got 40% of the country that actually believes this stuff. I'm just going to suggest to you that that's a level of social power and propaganda power that's unprecedented in human history. I'm going to give you the ancient origins of this debate. This is an old debate. It didn't necessarily involve transgenderism, but it involves questions of anthropology. The ancients looked at the world like this. There was the physical world, the natural world, and then there was the world of artifice, the things that men make, the artificial world, both by art, or what they called techne, and by convention, what they called nomos. These are things that weren't designed by human beings, but were created by human beings. So they made a distinction there. The question that they, they wondered about, and it's an interesting and important question, is a human nature even possible? And we sort of take that for granted. We use those words every day, right? But think about it. How can a natural being create an artificial world? And this perplexed the ancients, even the pre-Socratics. How can that be? I mean, I'm not here to give you answers to these questions. I'm just telling you the debate. I will tell you that I think Christianity gives pretty good answers to these. And if such a being does exist, a natural being that can create an artificial world, what would be the nature of such a being? Currently today, we have become so decadent in our society, and I mean decadent in the Latin sense of it, decadenced, out of step with one another. We are so out of step, so decadent in the society that we don't agree on what a human being is. That's how deep the division goes. I'm gonna give you a story about an NBC producer who wanted to interview me. 
And he came down to Dallas, finally worked real hard to get me alone, got me out to, to dinner. And then I think he was probably mic'd up and recording me. He said, well, I hear you're an Orthodox Christian, Jeff Younger. And I said, well, yes, I am. And he said, well, I'm gay. I went, okay, stop doing that. And he said, you mean I can't come to my church, your church uh, and be who I am? And I said, well, first of all, the first half of every service is praying for people like you who are outside the church. So you're the first person that should come before even I go. Secondly, um, I don't think you know who you are. I don't think you and I agree on what a human being is. You think a human being is a biological computer satisfying largely unconscious desires. And I don't think that's what you are. I think you're a hell of a lot more important than that. And he cried. He actually cried. We don't agree in this country even what a human being is. And I'm going to suggest to you with disagreements that deep, compromise may not be possible. So this is me with my son. At this time, he was about uh, seven years old. Here's how I've gone about combating this issue where the courts just won't stop her from transitioning my son. When he come to my home and he's with me 25% of the time, I would simply do things that I always do, but he was with me doing them. I don't believe in leadership styles and all that crap. I think there's one leadership style, lead by example. So when my boys said they wanted to box, yes, at 55, I had to step back in the ring, and I did. I paid for it too, by the way. You haven't lived until you've boxed 20 year olds that want to get back at your dad. There's one kind of leadership, lead by example. The first example that I had realized I had to set for this boy is that he had to be in church. And he likes going to church. And his brother Jude is utterly sincere, utterly sincere believer. And that's the first thing that I have to let them know God loves them. And I read, read them, even when I was legally prohibited, this is something you don't know, for a long period of time, the court legally prohibited me from telling my, teaching my son that he was a boy. And that prohibited me from teaching him traditional Christian teachings on sexuality and gender. And I spent five years under those orders. So what I would do is every night before they went to bed, I'd open the book of Genesis up to the creation of man and woman. I didn't make the argument. I let the holy book make the argument. That's the first thing that I did. And I suggest, whatever your religious persuasion is, I'm going to suggest to you that without a spiritual life, you're not going to succeed in, in, in keeping your children safe from the society that is being birthed from this transgender movement. Now, I'll put this out there. You can see my boys are much younger here. All right? They're about four years old, almost four. She started transitioning, James, right here on your left, at two. She began teaching him he was a girl at three. If you go onto YouTube and, and Google, Mommy Says I'm a Girl, you'll see the video that I, it was the first iPhone video I ever took. It's still the very first one on here. And it's my, me learning for the first time that she's teaching him that he's a girl. It's a shocking video. So I just want to tell you how they're playing here. So Jude has got the Hulk, and James has Thomas the Train. And Thomas the train is trying to get something done while the Hulk tries to smash the train. And they play for hours on these kinds of games. Why do they do this? They are learning how to contend in the world. They're learning that there are things out there that will prevent them from achieving their goals. There is a Satan that will deceive and tempt them away from righteousness. And they switch up each side being the one who's the obstacle and the one who's trying to get something done. One of the things that I have never done with my children is shield them from consequences as long as it doesn't hurt them. So let me give you an example. 
Um, my boys we, uh, uh, know that the, I have what I call the no rules rule, right? Don't make me make rules, be reasonable. Your room doesn't have to be perfectly cleaned up, but if it rises to the level of my attention, I will make rules, right? If you treat, if you treat me with respect reasonably, the answer is probably always yes. But if you lose my respect, the answer is always no. And they learned that very quickly. So we had one incident where they left an iPad on the floor and stepped on it. That's a thousand bucks. So I asked them, well, that's terrible. I mean, now that we know you're not responsible enough to have an iPad, how are you going to read your ebooks? And that was their problem to solve. Now they decided that they were going to help me do some things to earn my respect back. And then we had to make our one and only rule now at the house, you have to keep iPads on tables. But they by and large have learned to be reasonable. And it's largely because I let them play like this and encourage play like this. Learn how to overcome obstacles, make it a game, don't let it get you down. This is James at the bounce house. So this is a trampoline um, play park. I won't mention its name, it's near me. And then they have a season pass there, they used to. So we were there one day and they were in the dodgeball court. And guy was, you know, running around throwing balls like they do. Well, James is quick. So James was hitting him over and over again. And my son Jude isn't so quick, but he's super strong. So he nailed him. He nailed him hard when he saw he was going after his brother, right? All legit completely above board. So the guy comes over and starts pushing Jude. So Jude bases like I taught him from wrestling. He bases and just takes the kid down on the trampoline and lets him go. They don't let people push him around, but they don't hurt people either. And I think that's something we, we need to learn. Men need to be like a wall. You know, if, if a car runs into a, a, a solid brick wall, thick concrete wall, whatever, you know, it pushes back with exactly the amount of force that the car hits so that the wall doesn't move at all. If you push on a wall with 10 pounds of force, it pushes back with 10 pounds of force. That's why nothing moves. We don't strike out at people, but we don't move. And I think this is an example that we're going to have to teach ourselves and our boys. This is my boys learning what the real world's like. You lose sometimes. And sometimes losing hurts, and sometimes it's public, and sometimes it feels humiliating. But eventually, they got over worrying about losing in public. We need to do the same thing. Try some stuff. There's a lot of things we can talk about, about how we can overcome this. We'll get to that. But I think the first thing we have to overcome is the idea that if something we do fails, our, our, our fellow friends, our man, in the manosphere, our, our personal friends, our family, are going to somehow think less of us. You know what, man? The only person that has any right to criticize somebody who's trying to accomplish something are people who are trying to accomplish the same thing. Right? The honor goes to the man in the arena, not the spectator. Honestly, this is what drives me crazy when I watch football with my friends. Like, I, all of the, they, they criticize football players. I'm like, you're not on the field. How about we just enjoy the, the game as a form of entertainment? Criticizing these people is ridiculous. And they get serious about it. I'm sure you've heard football fans get serious about it. The honor goes to the man on the field. So your question has to be, am I on the field? Am I training how to hurt my enemies? Am I used to taking it when they stick it to me? Can I take it and give it right back? Because that's what my boys had to learn, and they learned it the hard way. So like I told you, look at that, look at that belly of mine. So I told you, I lead by example. So when they wanted to wrestle, guess what I had to do? The next thing you know, I'm wrestling with a guy who's a national champion getting choked out every weekend. But I had to do that for my boys, and to show that, you know, eventually I learned how to not get choked. Now. You know, old and slow as I am, that took a lot longer, but, but my boys learned it. This is them at a jiu-jitsu tournament where their instructor is just about to, to mount somebody and choke them out. And you notice how happy they are watching that? 
right? And they know that they can't criticize the guy that's losing. They know that. They have no right to criticize the guy that's losing. They're not wrestling this guy. They get it. They loved both those guys. They went and shook both of their hands. We need to be like that with each other. We're too critical sometimes of each other. We try to run each other down. And we all know that Anthony has faced that with people who tried to run him down. Iron sharpens iron, guys. You've got you to gotta stress people enough that they develop, but not enough that you break them. My boys have learned that. The other thing is I let my boys take risks, all kinds of risks. Crazy stuff that a lot of parents don't seem very comfortable with. First of all, we are outside all the time. We do not spend our time indoors. You cannot be tough if you do not go outside. I don't care how much time you spend in the gym. I don't care how pretty your quadriceps are or your gluteus maximus in that mirror. Your ass needs to get outside in Mother Nature because that is the only thing that makes you tough. Ask Marine and Army Infantry. How do they make you tough? It ain't the exercises. It's living in Mother Nature with not much food, getting in that heat, and doing the work anyway. You will get mentally and physically tough from that. Your pain tolerance will go way up. So my boys are always outside. It's well over 100 degrees out here. You can see the playground is completely empty because it's too hot for kids. Well, it ain't too hot for my kids. There is no too hot for my kids. My kids bring water. They know how to ration their water. They know when to sh sit in the shade when they get too hot. They control themselves like men. And they, they go out and can do anything they want because I'm confident that they're safe. In this particular case, I have a boy, Jude. He's the one on the right. Jude was born with a little bit of cerebral palsy, okay? He had a lot of trouble with cross-body coordination. She's like, how's this boy wrestling and boxing? Because I told you, speed of learning is way overrated. Way overrated. You know, his brother's really coordinated, picks things up really quick. I said, Jude, that's overrated. All you got to do is do 10,000 reps to his 1,000, and you'll be right there with him. So guess what Jude does? Jude says, well, okay, Dad, when are we going to do it? Because he knows I lead by example. So then we got to go outside and do 10,000 jabs over two weeks. Okay? So we worked on climbing up over obstacles and flipping over them. And this is a big day. He just went up and did it himself. It took about 100 repetitions. He finally got it. There are people who don't have the speed of apprehension of other people. There are people who aren't as gifted at speaking. There are people who have different backgrounds and they don't know the social milieu that we, we live in, right? All it means is you just need more reps. So don't get stuck on this idea that, wow, you know, I don't, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know how to do this. Anytime you say that to yourself, you just go, okay, What's the first thing I need to know how to do and how many reps do I need? Just get over that. This is us taking a hike. Again, it's well over 100 degrees. We're out by a lake. You know, this is another thing. When we go out hiking, we don't have a leader. We have leaders. Whoever's in front is in charge. My boys rotate. We rotate. My boys get to be in charge of me. Because I believe if you can't take leadership, you have no right to give it. Now, I used to do this little exercise back in my misspent youth as a consultant, where I used to list, it's a trick I used to do. In the morning, I'd have everybody list all the good qualities of a good leader. Then we go to lunch, we come back, everybody had forgotten it, and I'd say, hey, let's list all the qualities of a good follower, a good employee. And then I'd open up the two, and lo and behold, the list is exactly the same. A good follower and a good leader are exactly the same. If you can't take leadership, you can't give it. And you have no right to give it. Why should anybody take your leadership if you won't take theirs? I've taught my boys to, to take that leadership and take it seriously. Our safety is in their hands when they're in charge. They have to decide when the water breaks happen, what trails are too dangerous, what the weather's looking like. I don't even tell them how to get back out of the woods. They have to figure it out. Now, one day that cost me. We almost went to sundown. But they've learned. 
I let them lead and solve those problems in a safe environment. This is, this is them with some of their friends. My boys always look to cooperate with other people. They just know that anything they do, they're going to be better if they're cooperating with other people. That's another issue sometimes we men have, and especially when it comes to start to co coordinate on and cooperate on getting things done to improve our situation, we start seeing a kind of hierarchical scrabble for power. So this is James with his boxing coach. This guy was ranked number two in the world. He got knocked out by Lomachenko. That's what knocked him out of the first line. In my book, that's, that's pretty good. James, uh, we've got Olympic talent scouts interested in James for boxing. He's, uh, he's extremely talented. His jab is, was perfect the first time he ever threw it. His footwork is super, super, super fast. There's video out on YouTube. You can go see that, too. Um, I can't get this boy uh, in front of talent scouts because they won't talk to him because of this transgender stuff. So we're going to have to start understanding that the effects of some of these social policies that we're fighting against are going to affect you and your kids in unexpected ways. If they're not interested in him for this, what, what about ideological criteria later? We know that's already being used for hiring. Did you know that Sentiment analysis is already being used to scan resumes to see if you're a right winger. There are algorithms looking at your re resume to determine if you're a right winger or a men's rights guy or anti-trans. And you're not making it to the HR pile. You're getting screened out by a machine. So one of the bad things about leading by example is you also have to get punched. So this is my son practicing his low jab. This kid did this for two hours. He wouldn't stop, didn't want to stop. I don't know if it was because he just liked hitting his old man. I think it was because he just liked hitting something. You know? You need successes. You've got to have successes or you're going to quit. So your question you need to ask yourself in our movement is, what are our successes? Where have we succeeded? What have we changed? We talk about personal development all the time. Okay, you developed yourself. What the hell did you do with yourself? What have you achieved? You're developed. We need an answer to that question. And I submit we probably don't have a good one. I took my boys to Hawaii. The first thing they did when they got to the beach, they reenacted the conquest of Hawaii. They went out into the ocean and came up with swords and fought the natives. They are, here they are up high at a famous restaurant where uh, there's all these special kinds of geckos. You know, it's your natural instinct to want to do these things. You don't have to train anything. There's nothing to develop. In a sense, it's just letting yourself be unveiled. Your masculinity just needs to be unveiled. It's not something you learn. You already got it. And that's us in church. Now, I put this photo in here for a very specific reason. So one of the things I do, I do, I do weapons combat, and I have for 30 years. I went to the Philippines, I do full contact fighting there all the time. I fought with live blades, dull blades, all of it. I think there's a mentality problem with men. It's not a problem of masculinity, it's a mental attitude problem. So when I was in the Marine Corps, I always had my squad fix bayonets, even when we were doing long range combat. Why would I do that? Because mentally, you have the will to, to close with and engage the enemy. You will close with the enemy mentally when you have a weapon in your hand. I want to ask you to think about in your local communities, that could be your online community, but I'm hoping it's your geographical community in the United States. What weapons are available to you to use against your enemies? What weapons are available to you to defeat the matriarchal control of the laws that are preventing you from getting jobs, are going to prevent you from, from control of your children? 
What weapons are available? Hope you asked me about that in the questions. Sometimes you gotta do it together. Contending with one another ought to be for the purpose of getting better to defeat the enemy, not to, not to hurt the other guy. That attitude, I just haven't seen that, unfortunately. These are me and my boys. We're getting blessed by the priests on, a, on the name days for my boys. Remember I told you their name. This is on the name day for the prophet Daniel. We believe in God, a Trinitarian God. We, we're Christians. And I really believe that without some spiritual basis, you're not going to stand up to the forces that we're fighting because they are a kind of secular religion. You know, we talk about that, but what's the implication of that? It means, it means that you're not going to be able to rationally persuade them out of their point of view. I just don't believe our enemies really hold their opinions for reasons. They hold their opinions because of dispositions, feelings, a will to power, all sorts of things we could talk about. You will not be able to argue them out of your position. Is there a large, uncommitted middle on issues that are important to fathers? Well, I've tested this in Texas. I can't speak to every state, but I've tested this in Texas. There isn't. They're either on your side or they're not. You know, rationality is one of our big advantages, but it can be a disadvantage. It can make you think the other guy's purely rational. So I like this analogy to chess. Good chess players actually don't rationate over their next move. Most of the times, they don't even think very far ahead, actually, it turns out. Some of the best chess players say they only think one move ahead. It's just always the right move. How do they know that? Which one's the right move? Because they played thousands and thousands of games. And when they see the pawns in that arrangement with the rook kind of over in that side of the board, they know generally what's worked in the past. They have pattern recognition. One of the big things that's really good about a convention like this is you get to hear the stories of parents, fathers, men, and even women. And it increases your ability to recognize patterns, patterns of failure. And we talk a lot about patterns of failure, but this isn't patterns of failure, is it? This is patterns of how to checkmate. This is patterns of success. What patterns have succeeded? We should ask ourselves that. One way because we don't have a lot of successes. So you're going to say, well, where are we going to get those? Look at your opponents. You know, you know what the family law has done to my son. How did that happen? I've studied that very closely. I've looked at the legislative history. I read the laws. We, we had video at that time of the legislature, and I looked at the arguments. I've talked to the people that were in office at that time to know what they were thinking. When I went to the Texas legislature last ses session, I got my bill through the Senate precisely because I had recognized the patterns that had happened before. And I headed off the Lieutenant Governor of Texas and got it to committee just at the right time where he couldn't stop it. They were able to stop me in the House, barely, barely, and it's gonna cost two of them their seats. Remember I told you about what are your weapons? So in Texas, I've let legislatures know very clearly, if my son suffers from your inaction, you won't have a job in the Texas legislature anymore. And two of them are going out. Two of them are gone. They are going to be defeated in the primary. I have not looked for the means of persuasion with these people. Do I have to persuade someone? that cutting the balls and penis off a boy is an affront to morality? Do I really have to do that? Because if I do, honestly, this, this is really a person who's at the, at the moral stage of an animal and they need to be institutionalized. I'm not looking to convince anybody. I set out to force 
them to do what I wanted to do. I regarded them as soldiers in my army, and I directed them to what I wanted them to do. I never asked their permission, and if they didn't do what I wanted them to do, they suffered for it. Hard. Good and hard. You can ask many of the legislatures, even the ones that eventually supported me. They suffered hard for not coming out in support of my bill from the very beginning. I'll tell you how much political pressure we put on. This, the chief of staff told me that they had never had a bill, and that's a straight numerical calculation. This is not an opinion. It had, it had more lobbyists per day on my bills than in the history of Texas on any bill. We shut down the phones to the state capitol. They had to put in a new phone truck. Okay, all impressive, and I'm kind of bragging, I guess. But I'm mainly trying to tell you that I didn't know how to do any of this a year and a half ago. And everything everybody told me was wrong. All of the people that were telling me stuff were wrong. And I, honestly, they're well-minded people, but they're all women. They wanted me to try to persuade people. I didn't ever try to persuade people. I asked the question, how does, the, how, and I'll give you an example. There's a representative, he knows me very well. He, he listened to my issues with my son and did absolutely nothing about it, although he told me he would. I got his donor list. Very near me, there's a bank. And this big, the president of this big bank is one of his big donors. You saw that, um, that meme that I created with the judge and the cow? So I had a rancher castrating a, castrating a bull, and I put his face, the bank president's face, on that cowboy. And at the bottom, I listed three bank, banks with their addresses and promotions for checking accounts. And I went to visit him one day, I got an appointment, and I said, listen, um, I got a problem. This representative, who I'm not gonna name, is not helping me and you're a big donor to him, and I, I think you should get your money back and you shouldn't donate to him anymore if he's not gonna stop the chemical castration and physical castration of kids. And he said, oh, I don't get involved in policy like that. I said, well, I, I tell you, um, I normally don't get involved in commercial banking either, but I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna put 50 people outside your building and we're gonna give every customer that comes in your bank this, and we're gonna show that, look, they can move their accounts to banks that don't believe in doing this to kids. And I said, look out your window. And there were 50 people there. I didn't come there to persuade this bastard, this moral ingrate, this man who will sell children out for money. I didn't go to persuade an idiot like that. I told him he's going to lose his damn business or he's going to do what I want him to do, which is merely the right thing. I don't think about how to persuade our enemies. This is James deadlifting his body weight. Now, he didn't believe he could do this. Um, he, uh, he reached down to grab it, and he said, ooh, it's too heavy, it's too heavy. And a friend of mine was there, his boxing coach, and said, you got to try and lift it first. You haven't even tried to lift it. You just grabbed it and said it's too heavy. Try it, and if it drops out of your hands, we'll know it's too heavy. And he did. Then Jude did it 50 times, <laughs> you know. Jude's twice as strong as him. Um, these things seem hard. Like, you know, I, I guess I was just dumb. Like, everybody, I'll give you another example. I'm in the Texas legislature. They tell me the Democrats have tagged my bill in the calendar committee and it's never going to get a vote because it's been tagged. So apparently the Democrats have this right to tag bills and then you can't vote on them or something. So I'm crazy. So I just got the House rule book. Bought it for 200 bucks. Read the whole thing. Tagging's nowhere in there. Well, they've been telling us in Texas for 21 years that they're, they're tagging bills and there's nothing we can do. We can't vote on it. No such thing. Completely made up. Completely made up. So then I had, you know, 100 people show up to the calendar committee. They never had a person ever walk in that committee before. They keep it in a secret location. So we showed up with 100 people. It's open, open meetings in Texas. And we asked them, any, any representative here can motion for this bill to have a hearing. Who's going to do it today? Or who are we going to report to the news media and to their conservative counties where they're elected? Who are we going to report that you didn't do that? Well, it's tagged. 
And I said, who are we gonna, who are we gonna have to tell their constituents there's no such thing as tagging? You despicable liar. They got my bill out the next day, but they put it in the 900th bill. So it still never got a vote. But we tried. Didn't look like we could do it. And then we found out we could. Everybody had been lied to about what the rules say. These are my boys playing flag football. That's Jude. Jude's a center. He's an infallible receiver at close range. 100%. 100%. He can't run very fast because of his cerebral palsy, but he never drops a ball, never. So he's, he's their short range running game for them. James is a wide receiver and plays right defensive end, which is what I played in my misspent youth. These guys uh, have, have got to learn how to cooperate in a play. The plays never go as you plan. You gotta learn how to cooperate and adapt the play to make it, to pull it off, right? This idea of adaptation, right? I didn't know what was gonna happen when I went to the legislature. I didn't know what my elected officials were gonna tell me. I had no idea what all these grassroots fathers organizations were gonna tell me, okay? I had no idea. How many of you are for 50-50 parenting? You support that idea. How many are in favor of that? Almost everybody, okay. So through work that I've done, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not the, again, I'm nothing special. I'm, I'm literally not as talented as any in this room. I'm the least talented guy in this room. It was up to me, I'd be in a closet programming all day. I'm doing this because I got a kid whose life is at stake. We just had the, num the number two gubernatorial candidate in the state of Texas come out saying that if he's elected, he will call an emergency session of the Texas House to pass equal shared parenting. That's never happened in any state before. Never happened in Texas before. And it is sending absolute shock waves through the family law community right now. Shock waves. Here's why he did it. One, he knows fathers are important and he truly believes that. Two, he believes mothers are important and he truly believes that. Three, he believes children actually need both parents and he truly, truly believes that. And four, he's not afraid to use force to do good. He will use force against the enemies of equal shared parenting and make it happen. And he doesn't really care if the child support receipts to the state go down because both parents are simply taking care of their children themselves. Somebody asked me about Title IV-D and what Title IV-D is in the Q&A because it will tell you the incentives for all the evil that we're talking about here. So here I am again, you know, I got a box. That's the ring in the back where I always get beat up by the 20 year olds who wanna face down their dad in, in their fantasies. They wanna beat their dad at something. I'm the guy. This is where individual training happens. That's why I like my sons to be in an individual sport and a team sport both. This is where they learn, can they keep themselves going? You're tired. I mean, my boys do 24 rounds of this stuff. Think about me when I'm done with 24 rounds. They do 24 rounds, they're tired. Can they keep that technique up? You see Jude's dropping that right hand a little bit. Drop his left hand, sorry. You see that? He's tired. He's gonna get smacked for it. But they have to learn that their individual performance matters and you have to learn that you've got more in you than you think you do. You may think, you don't have any influence. You don't know anybody important. You live in a small town. You're in a big city and you're not involved in anything. How do you know? You've never done 24 rounds. You've never talked to these people. You've never gone and asked your precinct leaders. Hey, um, Anybody here for equal shared parenting? Anybody here uh, want to deal with this father's rights issue? Is, have you ever asked? Anybody? One. We can't do that, guys. The purpose of self-development is to go into the world and actualize your values. <laughs> There's no purpose to do self-development if you ain't going to do something with it. If you're going to get strong in a gym, 
That's good. What the hell are you going to do with that strength? What are you going to do? Do something with your power. And you'd be surprised. You're going to find that there's a lot of people thinking the same thing you're thinking. And there are a lot of people who will say, man, we tried that, that didn't work, here's why. And then you're going to find out how to do it better. So my boys basically have two paths, you know. My, my boy presents as a girl only with his mother and as a boy with everyone else. He could go two ways. This is us climbing up to a cliff up in Palo Duro Canyon. The boys did not want to do this. This was actually a fairly dangerous climb. Both of them made it to the top. Neither one of them bitched about it. And when they got to the top, all they wanted to do was to go down and climb back up. It looks scary. You think nobody's going to care, nobody's going to listen. People are going to listen. People are starting to understand that father's issues are human issues, they're children's issues. And un until you forge yourself into an identity group that can muster the political, economic, social, technological power, and dare I say propaganda power, you will not be able to affect change and you will not be able to stop this crazy roller coaster of, the, of matriarchal domination of, of fathers and family courts and anything else. What does that look like? First thing you've got to know, holy matrimony is absolutely not civil marriage. Read the marriage statutes in your states and you will discover they have nothing to do with matrimony whatsoever. They have 100% to do with the disposition of property in divorce and the disposition of federal funds which are, which are matched and collected by the states for their own benefit. That's literally all family law is. That's all it is. There is no security for your posterity under the law. You've got to understand that. In Texas, and in most of the states, there is a law that mandates what's called a standard possession schedule. In Texas, that's 24% of the time. It is presumed to be in the interest of the children that one parent have the standard possession schedule. That means one parent is presumed to be an absent parent, and it's presumed that that will be best for the child. It is a rebuttable presumption. And how many times do you think that gets applied to the mother? Ah, oh, not much, not often. We know in Texas that it gets applied to the father over 95% of the time. That's the actual number from the AG. I talked to him about four days ago. 95% of the time, it's applied to the father. So the father is presumed to get 24%, and it's presumed that's the best thing for the child in Texas law right now. Why 24%? That's an odd number, isn't it? It maximizes the reimbursements from the federal government for the collection of child support. Anything over 25%, and it starts going down. How much money does Texas get from the federal government for the collection of child support? 66 cents on the dollar. How much money is that totally? It's half a billion dollars to the state of Texas. It funds the entire Texas Attorney General's office. The Judicial Retirement Fund is funded from federal reimbursements from Title IV-D. The more child support assigned by a judge, the larger their retirement. In all the states, the, Texas, the Attorney Generals, which administer these programs, give quotas to judges for child support. That's why in no state will you ever get 50-50. If they give 50-50 to every parent, half a billion dollars goes away. It's gone. This is about money. I haven't even talked about Title IV-E, where they give $100,000 for every baby they adopt out. What do you think happens in those Children's Protective Service offices when they start getting low on budget they start looking around for an 18-month-old white baby with no medical problems. Adopt them out, no more budget problems. Your enemies instituted this in the 1970s, full well knowing what it was going to do to you as a father. 
full well knowing it would take away your rights to your posterity. They are operating on a level you can't imagine. Let me tell you how they operate in Texas on these gender clinics. So there's a, Genesis, a clinic called the Genesis Clinic. Now, yes, they do that to give the middle finger to Christians. It's called the Genesis Clinic in Dallas, Texas, and they chop kids' private parts off there. They chemically castrate them, too. So at the Genesis Clinic, before they ever built it, it cost about $100 million to build. I know this because I got legal discovery in my case on all this. It cost about $100 million to build. They went into key Senate districts all throughout Texas and got local banks on the hook for loans to build that. Those guys are all big donors to senators in the state of Texas. You think they want to shut down that clinic and endanger those loans? Your enemies are playing at a level that you have not even contemplated. If you don't forge yourself into an identity group that can exert social, political, economic, and propaganda power, you will not be able to thwart them. Self-improvement is not enough. You need collective action, collective political action. This is what's in danger. This is the Lao Kun. This is probably one of my favorite sculptures in all, all time. This is the sculpture that actually started the Renaissance in Europe. Uh, medieval sculptors could not believe it when they saw it. They didn't even think it was real. Some thought it had been actually buried by God. It was so hard to imagine that somebody could do it. But this is a Lao Kun and an angry Athena persuaded Poseidon to kill Lao Kun's sons because he had the temerity to help her enemies in the Trojan War. That's the story. And this, these are his sons being devoured by the serpents. And if you look, He's pulling the serpents to his body to let his kids escape. In the story, none of them do. This current social system has so imperiled fatherhood that it is not an exaggeration to say that you are one temper tantrum from a wife from being there with your sons. That's what it was for me. That's who runs family court, gentlemen. No matter, I'm telling you, whether it's Republican or Democrat, I want you to think about it. You want to sit in front of that red-haired harpy? She's going to make all your parenting decisions. She's going to decide whether you can homeschool, what public school they go to, if they can go to private school, what private school they can go to, who their pediatrician is, who, what psychologist they're going to go to, and whether you can get the psychological records and know what the psychologist is teaching or counseling your children. Did you know that in no state in the United States do you have a right to see the psychological records of your children in counseling? Counselors are legally allowed to give secret counseling sessions and not tell you in all the 50 states. And courts ordered it. That's what happened to my son. They ordered a counselor, and the counselor refused to tell me what she was teaching my son, and my son told me, she's telling me that I'm a girl. That's who's going to be in charge of your posterity. I have a friend of mine who's a Christian. She changed his religion, and she's, he's being raised by another man. He sees this other man 75% of the time. And there's nothing you can do to stop it once it starts. This is a temptation of Eve. Who tempted Eve in the story? Who remembers this? Come on, Satan, right? We haven't gone that far from our, our heritage, right? Who tempted Adam? Eve. Eve. What was Adam punished for? He wasn't punished for eating the apple. He was punished for listening to his wife. This is the, the plight of all children in the modern world. This situation, these temptations affect adults and then it affects kids. You've heard Jesse Lee Peterson talk about the hierarchy, God over man, man over woman, woman over child, all of the family, a dominion over nature. Notice this is the exact opposite. It goes in the exact opposite direction. 
This is how it's actually working. It's just that now Eve's in charge. I don't tolerate feminist bullshit anywhere I go. I don't tolerate it from my clients, and I've told my clients I'll fire them if they do this feminist bullshit. I've told them that my, my employees do not have to do their crazy ass feminist training. We don't do any of that. I confront them everywhere, and I do it in court too. Believe me, you can ask my judge. I expose their feminist presuppositions for the bigotry and false female supremacy that they really are. It's just a form of bigotry, anti-male bigotry. Confront it everywhere. And the question is, how are you going to do that? I've asked you to think about what are the instruments of power that you can bring to bear to confront something like that. I would suggest that Peterson actually did a pretty good job here. He totally destroyed her. And it was actually so, so uh, amazing that it was funny, beyond belief funny. I mean, Peterson can barely stop himself from laughing. He's really trying not to laugh because he doesn't want to be mean. But he totally destroyed this woman by simply exposing her presuppositions. I confront it everywhere. I don't tolerate it, and I don't want my sons to learn to tolerate it. I've even told my sons, chivalry is not owed to all women. And that's an uncomfortable fact we're going to have to come to grips with. Chivalry was a system which bound both men and women. Men bound themselves to a life of service, and what did women do? Anybody know the, the duties of, two duties of women under chivalry? Chastity and obedience. Where will you find a chaste and obedient woman these days? Most women are not owed protection from men. They have to earn it. A red-haired harpy feminist, my sons are not going to protect her. We are not going to protect people who are trying to destroy the values that we want to build. Now, earlier I was listening to a talk, and one of the speakers, um, Mr. Cortez, was talking about, he used a word called hyperreality. Anybody familiar with that term? Not hyperreality, yeah. So you know Jean Baudrillard, the French, he's a French, he's often listed as a French postmodernist philosopher. I do recommend that you all study postmodernism, even if you hate it, as I do. Because there's no doubt that we're living in a postmodern era. I mean, there, Baudrillard, for example, I think was horrified by postmodernism, and he was simply describing what he was seeing, not advocating for it. But this idea of hyperreality is that people actually live in a simulation. They don't actually live in the real world anymore. He actually wrote a fascinating book called The Iraq War Never Happened. And which he sh what, what he shows is that everyone, even the battlefield participants, know everything that happened by recorded television segments that have been spliced together. Even the intelligence people were looking at these kind of spliced video feeds and other things. Really, nobody saw what really happened. And he, you know, and he said it's the most simulated war in history. And he says most people, if you look at social media, live in a world that's completely fabricated and simulated. You know, when you, when you see somebody's feed, this isn't their real life, that's the life they're simulating to you. And Baudrillard makes an even further claim, and I think it's quite accurate. He says, it becomes so simulated that the original becomes lost, and now it's a simulation with no original. A simulacra. And at that point, the, something which is simulated most often becomes the most true, the most believable. It takes a lot of effort to break yourself out of these simulations. It comes in all kinds of ways in the propaganda that we're given around fatherhood. Um, for example, one of the things that I'm always, I'm always en enduring in Texas is uh, angry legis female legislators will say, you guys just don't want to pay child support. And, and I'm supposed to be in the simulation, and I'm supposed to say, well, no, we don't mind paying child support. Of course we want to pay our wife's money, right, our ex-wife's money. I'm supposed to say that, because that's what everybody says. But I'm not in that simulation anymore. It took me years to crawl, pull my mind out of it and really just bloodily crawl out of it, like over broken glass. But I'm in there, so I just tell them, of course I don't want to pay child support. I want to support my own kids. I want to provide for them myself. I don't want to give money to somebody else to provide for them things that I don't want to give them. 
I want to provide for my kids myself. And that's what a father is. So of course I don't want to pay child support. Why do you want to make me give my money to somebody else to support my kids when I'm perfectly able to support my kids myself without doing that? And they're just like flabbergasted. Like apparently in 21 years in Texas of like fatherhood, nobody's ever told them that. Yeah, I don't want to pay child support. I want to support my own kid. I'm not in the simulation. You got to break out of their presuppositions. So there's an old Roman maxim. Do not quote laws to men with swords. It's stupid. It's stupid. This is kind of how I feel in my situation. I feel like I'm, I'm taking the laws of science, and, and, the, and that could be a Bible too, laws of morality, and throwing them at the gender police who are trying to kill my son. That's like quoting laws to men with swords. They're coming to beat me and put me in a cage if I don't shut up. They want to put me in solitary confinement. I've been threatened with that. Put me in solitary confinement if I don't shut up. These are men with swords. They are not coming to negotiate with me. So I don't quote laws to them. Again, I ask, what are the means of coercion? Remember, we looked at this at the very beginning. Could I be thrown in solitary confinement? Yep. I could be like Diogenes, living in a, living in a pot, a clay pot. But one good thing about solitary confinement, there'll be no nagging woman to bother me all day. All right. Any questions? All right. Let's, uh, let's clap. <laughs> That's a good, great. We've got 10 minutes. Uh, if anyone has any questions at all, come on up here to the mic and ask Jeff. Hey, Jeff, uh, great presentation. Thanks, man. What do men and fathers need to do to turn this thing around? Right on. I know right now there's the state of Kentucky, state of Arkansas, mm -hmm. uh, both have equal shared parenting. Mm -hmm. But what can we do to make a difference, make an impact, and put uh, fathers back in children's lives? So it's, in, in both of those cases, the question is about how do you change the legal regime? around marriage, which makes you more secure in your posterity. Um, look at how they won in those states. So have you looked in Kentucky and looked at how they won? How'd they win? Tell us. Effort confronting their legislators, their um, uh, house reps, their senators. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, and generally it took a, a couple years to get the that legislation passed. So in Texas, we've been trying for 21 years to get it. So um, you want to look at specifically at what political tactics were used if you want to change the laws. And again, you're, gonna, you're not going to find a legislator who's going to say, yeah, you're right, fathers shouldn't have equal time with their kids. Nobody believes that. Absolutely nobody believes that. The feminists don't actually even believe that. Right? For them, it's the largest uh, uh, transfer of wealth from men to women in the, in the country. That's, for them, that's what it is. It has nothing to do with the children. Even they wouldn't say that. So it's not about persuading. And often we don't talk about like what kind of tactics. I gave you examples of some concrete tactics I've used to force people to do what, the right thing when they don't want to do it. Um, having a, a big bullhorn helps. Having the ability to communicate with their constituents. If you're not going into the key precincts for elected officials and talking to the people there and telling them what they're doing, you'd be surprised how many people don't even know that they're doing these things. Hey, Jeff, great presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, you had alluded to some of the uh, incentives that you know sort of drove the legislators and mm. the judges to make the decisions. So with the 4D, with yeah. 
you know, uh, can you kind of expound on that a little bit? Because I think yeah. it, it it makes it more real to the people who are to who might be on the fence or like, well, uh, is there really a problem? Well, yes, yeah. there is. Yeah. Even before they take steps to do the actions to correct it, they need to know what it is. Yeah. So the root of this problem is uh, Title IV-D and Title IV-E. Title IV-D is the one I'll talk about because it deals with most custody issues. So uh, this was a law that was pushed very hard by Jimmy Carter in the 1970s. Um, it's a law that provides 60 cents on the dollar matching funds for the payment of child. So when I pay, I pay $2,500 a month in child support. So when I pay that money, 66 cents on every dollar goes to the state agency that collects the child support. All right, so they get back two thirds of the money that they collect. And this creates a massive financial incentive for the states to never do anything to reduce child support or take any public policy action that would reduce payments of child support. The reason in Texas, it's the standard possession schedule gives you 24% is that you start getting descending payments back. You start losing cents on the dollar when you get above 25% custody. So it's set to maximize payments to the states. And the, the, some of the incentives are very perverse. You know, you, you know how, in the, how can you, you got to imagine, how could it be possible that you could give quotas to judges for the collection of child support? Right? You don't, they don't know the cases that are coming before them. They don't know the facts of these cases, but they're given quotas and they have to assign a certain amount. Once it's assigned, how lucky do you think you're going to be in getting it reduced? Let's say you go through COVID and you lose your business. Can you get your child support reduced? It's never in the best interest of the child for the child to have less money, is it? It's never in the best interest of the state to reduce its own uh, re reimbursement under Title IV-D, is it? So I have a friend in Texas. His, he and his wife came to an ex-wife came to an accord. They agreed on 50-50 custody and she waived child support on that basis. The Texas Attorney General sent a lawyer to the hearing where they were finalizing this order and said, we don't believe that they should have 50-50 because no one will pay child support. Think about that for a second. The Texas Attorney General is arguing against letting a father have 50% of the time, even when the mother agrees, because it reduces child support collections. There's a half a billion dollars on the line and very powerful money and interests are out there making sure that you will not have control of your posterity. And the question for you is, can you muster enough political, economic, social, technological, and propaganda power to beat them? Okay, I, I was raised by Southern Baptists. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so in my adult life, I've done some lobbying also yeah. in legislatures yes. for a, a rebuttal presumption of shared parent, equal and shared parenting. Yes. yes. It has been my experience that in addition to what we know is the typical screaming feminist, some of my largest opposition has come from conservative women's religious groups. 100%. I was wondering if you could share a little bit of your perspective and experience mm -hmm. with that. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I'll give you a little, uh, I, you know, I've, I'm, I, I have a math background, so I love to give demonstrations, but I've discovered that demonstrations provoke skepticism, so I always lead with examples now. I've learned, the, I, I learn slow, but, and I learn the hard way, but I do learn. So here's an example conversation that I just recently had in Frisco, Texas. I'm sitting there with a friend of mine that I'm trying to talk into running for county chair. He doesn't want to do it. And it looks like I didn't twist his arm enough to make him do it, but I'm still going to try. He's a, he'd be very good at the job. This woman comes up to us, and she knows both of us. And you may have heard that Alan West, the candidate for governor, his wife got arrested for drunk driving. And it turns out she wasn't drunk. It was just pure harassment All right, in Dallas County, where, where my kid's at. Dallas County is very corrupt. So Alan West had n not very good things to say to the police officers that roughed up his wife during the arrest. And this woman said, you know, Alan West, he, would, he did not sound you know, like a strong executive. He did not sound like a diplomat. He did not sound like a gentleman. And so my, my friend, uh, we'll just call him Pat, sitting next to me, he says, oh yeah, that's, that's right, I remember that. You know, he's going on with that. 
And then she kind of like breaks and then she looks at me. She shouldn't have done that. So I said, um, ma'am, um, I don't think you should be setting standards for how men communicate. Like, I don't tell you women how to talk. Why are you telling us men how we should talk? I said, did you know Alan West is a combat veteran? That he's, he's led combat battalions in Iraq? I said, did you know that? Did you know that Alan West has been in bayonet combat, hand-to-hand -hand combat with our enemies? And has killed men with his bare hands? I said, did you know that? And she's just looking at me like, what? And I said, do you really expect some alpha ma male like that to talk nicely about somebody roughing up his wife? Do you really expect men of action to talk like effeminate diplomats in long togas in, this, in the Roman Senate? Like, what do you expect a combat veteran to talk like? We men who heard him understood exactly what he was talking about. We don't like other men putting their hands on our women. I said, so don't come enforcing your, uh, you know, your, um, I forgot the word I used, it was, it was not nice. It was uh, busybody or something like that. Don't bring your busybody stuff over here telling us men how to talk. If you want an effeminate man, you already have a governor, Governor Abbott, state of Texas, and you can vote for him. You want an effeminate man. That's your boy. Very presidential, very diplomatic. Doesn't do a damn thing for you. So there's a, there is a huge problem of this. There's a giant problem of white knight men who just will support women no matter whether they're wrong or right, and conservative women who, oddly enough, buy into the feminist narrative that women have been oppressed throughout history. How many of you believe that? Who believes it? You believe it? Do you believe it as well? Do you believe that women were oppressed, uniquely oppressed throughout history? No. no, I don't either. It doesn't even make sense, right? So, you know, we talk about, you know, they didn't have the right to vote. Well, neither did most men. You know, 80% uh, of women appropriated, only 20% of men appropriated. We know that from mitochondrial DNA studies. Like, by any measure of success, men have, men have probably had it worse, at least as bad as women, that's for sure. Everybody was oppressed in history. That's how it was. So they, but they buy into that, and then they mate that with a kind of conservative values. So they have all the grievances of feminists dressed up in um, you know, a kind of Christian theology that says that they should rule the house. And they become these busybodies that tell you what to do all the time, and what you should do, and how you should act. All sorts of stuff. Um, in my case, like where I live, in the area of Texas that I live, I mean, you have to actually neutralize all these women before you can even like run for office. Like they, they just will create this entire gossip network. They're very powerful. Um, but one of the things that I would love to see us do, and it's worked for me very well, personally, and it's worked for all my friends, is simply telling women the truth. You don't get to tell me how to talk. You don't have my social responsibilities. When you do, you can tell me how to exercise them. Otherwise, sit down. I'm not gonna tell you how to be a mom. Don't tell me how to do my business. Don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, have any, I don't have any bones about telling women that. Thanks guys. What he represents is patriarchy. We're here to do work as men, as patriarchs. There's nothing more natural than being a father.